I think if I hear you call me Becky one more time, six pack, I'm gonna pop your tops. All six of them. Hi, this is Matt once again. What about to another review, a Patreon request from RB. Uh, the reason I'm doing a lot of reviews for him is he actually got a very big tier on my Patreon. And I really, really appreciate it, RB. That was really kind of him to do so. So thank you so much. And for those who's ever interested in my Patreon, that and my PayPal links are down below in the info box. And the review for today is History of the World Part 1, a Mel Brooks film. Now, Mel Brooks, I do enjoy as a director. I've enjoyed quite a few of his movies. I liked Spaceballs. I liked Robin Hood Men in Tights, which I haven't seen in a while, but I remember enjoying it. I even enjoyed Dracula Dead and Loving It, which some consider one of his worst movies, but I actually had a lot of fun with that. I thought Leslie Nielsen was pretty entertaining, as was Mel Brooks' Van Helsing. My favorite Mel Brooks film, that'd be tough. That'd be really tough. Because I like Spaceballs, but I really enjoy Blazing Saddles and Young Frankenstein. I mean, right now I want to say Blazing Saddles, but Young Frankenstein's up there too. I mean, he's made a lot of good work. There's some I'm kind of iffy on. High Anxiety, his takeoff of Alfred Hitchcock, I was like, eh, wasn't big on. Silent movie I haven't seen. That's one I would like to give a look someday. Silent movie. I'm trying to remember what else he's done. But this one... I would say after watching it, it's less on a totem pole for Mel Brooks. I liked it more than High Anxiety, but all the ones I listed I would put above History, History of the World Part 1, which I could barely say. Because there are aspects I liked about it. This is not a rant. Believe me, if I hated it, I would rant on it. It's it's called History of the World Part 1. It almost seemed as if at first he just wanted to do a movie about the Roman Empire and went, damn, I only have like 40, 50 minutes after it's done. So let's add this... French Revolution bit, and let's add this 2001 Space Odyssey parody with the 8 minute at the beginning. Let's add this Caveman bit after that. And the Roman Empire stuff, I would say, is the best part of it. The 40 50 minutes. I don't know if that's because it's obviously the one that's the most fleshed out. Well, that and the, the Spanish Inquisition, I can't forget that. And I think when I... Geez, I have seen this before a long time ago, but I didn't remember too much, so it was nice to revisit it. But I remember my first thought when I saw it long ago was, with that title, I thought it was going to be a lot more smaller segments. I wouldn't call it an anthology. Maybe I would call it like an anthology comedy, where it'd be maybe 10 minutes, 5 minutes, 10, 5, 10, maybe 15 of the history of the world. But yeah, it's little snippets and then this one bid part for 50 minutes and then one or two things. And maybe I thought I would cover more history, which is stupid. I mean, it's called part one, even though there's that's meant as a joke. It was never supposed to be part two. I know there's a stupid rationale for it, but that was my first thoughts. 
but at the same time, the first 10 or so minutes is really rough. When it begins, it's a 2001 Space Odyssey parody because you have the same music, the ape men, but they're masturbating. Just like a girl, oh, really. It was fun that Orson Welles was narrating, but that's about it. And then the caveman, oh, here's the first artist painting the cave, and then here's the first critic, and the guy pisses on the wall of art. How cavemen did a straight woman, they did a woman bop her on the head, did a homosexuality, a guy banes a guy on the head with a club. Humor, a guy's trying to make them laugh, they don't laugh. A cheap looking dinosaur grabs them, they laugh. I, 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 I can't really say I was laughing much until I got to the will quit thing with Moses, where it's, he's give it to you, these 15, 10, 10 commandments. I think it was when Mel Brooks actually got into the picture. Because Mel Brooks, no, he's a good act, good director, but he's a good actor. He's a nice comedic actor with his line delivery, with his energy. It seems like a lot of people didn't really cast him in roles as an actor. Maybe he declined or just didn't want to or just wanted to save it for his movies. But he's actually rather good, whether it be as the wannabe Yoda and Spaceballs or... I, I'm sorry, I'm laughing at this rolling Blazing Saddles. Looking at the tits. Shows where my mind's going. But, you know, that's when it, it, it picked up. Because I thought that was the first jolt that made me smirk and chuckle. Was there was 15 commandments. Now there's 10. And the Roman Empire stuff. We got Mel Brooks. Gregory Hines. Which I guess apparently that was supposed to be Richard Pryor. But this might have been around the time with the fire incident. I'm not sure. Or as Richard Pryor said in his stand-up when he struck a match, what's this? Richard Pryor going down the street. <laughs> Since you all love me so much. Where, because of a drug episode, he set himself on fire. Some say it was a suicide attempt. Some say it's not. Whatever you want to believe. If that's the case, that's such because that's the second time Richard Pryor was going to be in a Mel Brooks film because he was going to be the star of Blazing Saddles, which would have been really cool, although I like the actor they got. And Gregory Hines is fine, but I really would love to have seen Richard Pryor because I think he really would have brought an even bigger, smart, bigger spark. I mean, Gregory Hines did fine, but you know, I'm a big Richard Pryor fan. That would have been really cool to see. But the Roman Empire segment, like I said, goes on for like 50 minutes. It's easily the, the longest, biggest part of the movie. I think that was the weird thing is that all these other ones are so much smaller, but this one is so much longer. I'm kind of wondering what the story is behind that. Was it meant to be always be that long? Was it just, hey, this is the most jokes I could get out of? Is this time period? Is the one I want to be focusing on the most? that interests me the most as a writer or director even in the comedy realm and you know the humor was working like the unemployment line the gladiator comes up to employment line and the girl goes did you kill someone this week no did you try to kill someone this week yeah okay here's your check okay what are you Blah, blah, blah. I'm a philosopher. Oh, you're a bullshit artist, huh? Did you bullshit? Did you bullshit someone this week? No. Did you try to bullshit someone this week? Yes. <laughs> and that's Bill Burt's character, the bullshit artist that the girl's giving shit to. Like that made me laugh. Like moments like that made me laugh. That's what I mean. When Bill Burt enters the picture and some of that dialogue, Gregory Hines, he's a slave who. They try to kill him. He escapes. Mel Brooks and his buddy befriend Gregory Hines. 
Well, then at least another Mel Brooks is put in front of Julius Caesar, a.k.a. Dumb Deloise, which I didn't need the farting and the burping, maybe because that stuff doesn't make me laugh. I don't care for that type of humor. I mean, I'm a guy that I'm fine with slapstick humor. I'm fine with humor dealing with dialogue, but gross out, burp, fart jokes, they're just stuff I never gave a shit about. Never found them funny, even as a kid. I was just found them irritating and cheap and lame. And Dumb Deloise, he likes to, you know, I would say he likes to shit, but that's, that'd be a different movie. He likes to fart and burp. Did you tell how un PC the film is around this time? Well, films in general. How Dumb De Luis's character uses the word that rhymes with maggot and it starts with an F. With this character who works with them, who is supposed to be a gay character. And I'm not offended by that because I, it's just words. It's a movie. Don't get so offended by a movie. I'm offended if the movie sucks dick. I'm more offended by that. But you know, it's a movie. It's a movie. Uh, I just mentioned that where you would not do that today. That was my observation. Wow. Dialogue like this. Or hell, another type of movie. 48 Hours. With how Nick Nolte's character talks to Eddie Murphy. You would never have a character talk like that nowadays. Which, I mean... It's not that I tolerate that language. But it's just... If it's just a movie, a movie's a movie, just, you're not doing it to harm, you're doing it for Dumb Deloise's character is a dumb, idiot, leader, Caesar. Yeah, the type of stupid thing he would say. So, okay, a stupid person saying stupid things makes sense to me. But I really liked another character, Cloris Leachman. I like that actress. She was in other Mel Brooks films. And she tries to hit on Gregory Hines when he's pouring, say when, and she's like 8.30. But her energy was welcome. I liked her. When this battle happens and the guys are looking for Mel Brooks in them, they enter the chamber of women where Cloris Leachman is the leader of the women. And she's like, virgins? Put on your no entry signs. They literally put on signs. Patrick Trojans? Ah, gee, I just ran out. <laughs> See, moment, jokes like that, I, I chuckled. And maybe that's why Mel Burtz wanted to focus on this particular time period because of these type of jokes. And I didn't. I thought quite a bit of it was witty. Other than, I wish he was Richard Pryor than Gregory Hines, although I do like Gregory Hines, may you rest in peace. And Dom DeLuise not needing to fart and burp, you didn't need that. The rest of it, enjoyable segment. I mean, it ends with <laughs> one Moses, you think he's parting the ways of waves of water for our heroes, but he's really being stuck up <laughs> and so he's trying to rob him. That's why his hands are up. And then you get the Last Supper with John Hurt, yes, from Alien, who would also be another Mel Brooks film, Spaceballs. John Hurt playing Jesus Christ. I forgot that John Hurt was in that, that that was cool. The way the Last Supper painting is done. The Spanish Inquisition, that was a fun bit with some of the dialogue like it's a whole song and dance about this horrible time in history they shoved a poker up my ass and not a taste of preparation in sight <laughs> and also the, the way the set the the way it was designed where for example there's this people jackpot machine like all these people located on this huge jackpot machine so people will roll around ding 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 and look like, like real people there and like how that was built and how they did it and 
I was just impressed by the, the set design that they had in that scene. And, you know, Mel Brooks and his company having the son and dance of the Spanish Inquisition, it's, it takes a, a smart, witty writer to make that work. Where a moment where people were tortured and to make that funny. But Mel Brooks did it. So that's definitely one of the best parts of the movie, the Spanish Inquisition. And when people talk about Mel Brooks filmography or a documentary on Mel Brooks, that's usually one of the scenes that pops up for good reason. And then the, the last act of the film is the French Revolution. Where the king, he's worried about that he's going to get assassinated. So they get the piss boy, the piss bucket boy, who was very similar to the king, both played by Mel Brooks, to pretend to be him. I would say Mel Brooks as the king is the best part of that, with some of the way he gives his portrayal of this asshole character like he's hitting on all these women and he says it's good to be the king <laughs> or this girl wants her father out of jail and he goes you don't put out he don't get out <laughs> or someone goes hey you look like the piss boy and it's like well you look like a bucket of shit <laughs> so I mean that stuff other than that, that's really all I got out of the third segment was Bill Burt's fun portrayal of this asshole king. And then the way it ends, like, there's going to be a sequel, Jews in Space, and, like, a cheap knockoff of Star Wars. That was entertaining as well. I kind of, probably the, in a way, inspiration for Spaceballs. Not exactly what happened in that scene, but the idea of doing a Star Wars comedy type it was interesting to see sort of the the roots of that in a way the start of that but i mean the history of the world part one i do think it's uneven i do think the way it begins the first 10 minutes are really rough with the masturbating eight men and the cavemen stuff you've honestly could have just taken all that out then which i know then the dates or do it better or the only interest was like wow orson welles is narrating that's it. When it gets to the Roman Empire stuff, then I got some laughs out of it. I thought Mel Brooks did a good job. Gregory Hines was fine. Cloris Leachman was a lot of fun. And then the Spanish Inquisition, very catchy song. The Inquisition, da da da, the Inquisition. Definitely one of the best parts of the movie. And then it ends not as strong. Again, the French Revolution stuff was like, eh, it's there. And then the final bit, the, the sequel, Jews in Space, kind of brought it up a little bit. So it, I think it's an uneven movie. It gets some funs and chuckles. Obviously, you've either seen the film or if you're a Mel Brooks comedy fan, it's worth one watch. I'm sure many people like it more than me. It just, I would, I prefer Blazing Saddles, Young Frankenstein. Spaceballs, yes, even Dracula Dead and Loving It and Robin Hood Men in Tights. I thought those were just more consistently funny compared to this. That's just my opinion. But anyway, thanks for watching. Thank you once again, RB, for your kindness. Thanks to everyone who's pledged to my Patreon. Take care, and we'll see you guys later. Bye bye.